Good morning, guys. Um, we are uh, we continue to have our uh, Tuesday morning sessions, of primarily just education for uh, ourselves here. Uh, we continue to grow uh, on the Frisco campus of uh, Tech Scottish Rite, and we continue to want to know from each department and learn from each other, um, as well as uh, teach those in the community as well. So um, every morning we have this uh, lecture, uh, not every morning, but every uh, once a month we'll have this lecture. We've got a, a list for the next year. Um, so if you guys want to go ahead and put that on your calendar. Uh, and one of the subject topics that we uh, are really interested in is fracture care and pediatrics. And the reason is, is um, just about everyone in this room gets a call uh, for uh, their kid or a neighbor uh, that had an injury and you know our fracture team uh, here that was really put together three years ago um, has really been probably one of the most successful clinics and, and group of people that we put together uh, or that has been put together here at uh, Scottish Rite and so uh, that's really been uh, led by a core group of, uh, of a really really special and talented team and Jared's going to talk to us a little bit about the top 10 things uh, to know about pediatric fractures uh, and I'll give the mic to Jared. Thanks Dr. Ellis. So uh, thanks for everybody coming out this morning. Really appreciate you all being here. Um, hope everybody found the coffee. If you didn't, this is super informal. It's set up to be that way. So uh, don't hesitate to get up and grab something if you need it. Um, also, if there's any questions or anything that you want to kind of expand or, or know something more about, just let us know and uh, just throw a hand up and we'll uh, get it answered. So we'll kind of run through here uh, today. We are going to talk about the top 10 things to know about pediatric fractures. So starting off, number 10. You're treating the patient and the parents. It's important to remember this. Uh, I think oftentimes that's lost, and, and sometimes we as clinicians uh, have, it, it's easy to kind of miss that fact. I would say that the majority of the second opinions that we see in clinic really are seeking clarity. They're not necessarily seeking uh, a different treatment option. They're, they're really just needing to understand more about the treatment options that was given. And uh, particularly with pediatrics and with parents, uh, a lot easier for me to understand now that I have kids, but you, you kind of view things differently when it's your child, and uh, certainly keeping that in perspective is important. So uh, you've got to be able to get these parents to buy in. Spending an extra you know, little bit of time up front on the first visit probably going to save you a lot of time in the back end on subsequent visits. So for us, these, these first initial visits are pretty uh, time consuming. Uh, a lot of times it's the psychology game kind of explaining to these families, um, you know, particularly different things as far as remodeling, uh, as far as the exam, what you're looking for, and then really sitting down and laying out a timeline and what you expect and how you you know, really expect or anticipate the uh, the visits going subsequently afterwards. If that family leaves and they don't have a good understanding of what to expect and they come back, uh, they come back and their surprises, you know, those things need to be addressed immediately. Uh, it's better to kind of face those head on. Uh, you know, pediatric injuries just in general are not straightforward. A lot of times there's things that are a little bit abstract and particularly looking at x-rays and findings on x-rays that uh, don't always make sense. So explaining those are important to the families. So some of the things that we do are utilize some tools and kind of uh, some analogies or examples to kind of give them a little perspective. So for instance, uh, the fractures you can't see, which comes up a lot in pediatrics, we call these occult fractures or uh, sometimes the Salter Harris one fractures of the physis or the growth plate. Uh, I like to use this little analogy uh, for an example for these families is to kind of tell them, you know, look, if, if we have a patient that comes in and uh, has, well, if there was a little fissure running through here, a little crack through here, you may not always see it. Sometimes you'll see a little widening, sometimes you'll see uh, some subtle changes, but oftentimes this is really a clinical diagnosis, meaning that you had to go take your, your, um, his, your history, your mechanism of injury, and, and kind of combine that with your physical exam, and, and sometimes the x-rays can kind of help you with that. Another example is an occult supracondylar fracture where these kids will come in with this joint effusion, so you can see back here, uh, there's a shadow, we call this a posterior fat pad sign. There's not a clear fracture or break to point out and say, hey, here's the crack right here. So uh, you kind of have to explain to the family, listen, we have a swollen elbow, we have a fall on an outstretched arm, uh, we have soreness and kind of all of our clinical exam points to this elbow. And then on x-ray, we also, in addition to those, we have this effusion sign, which is what the posterior fat pad sign is. Uh, this, these are fat pads that lay up next to the bone without an effusion where all this bleeding or this hematoma is. They lay right up next to it and they don't really project on an x-ray. But when bleeding occurs in that joint, that capsule fills up and you get this displacement of these fat pads, which kind of shows up on the x-ray to kind of help guide you. We know as clinicians that when you see this, you need to be uh, astute to the fact there's, there's a fracture here somewhere and you have to figure out what it is. Most of the time that's a supracondylar fracture, but there 
are some other uh, possibilities. But explaining that to the family rather than just telling them, nope, it's a fracture, there's a, a crack in the bone, no, I can't show you, I can't tell you where that's at or point that out to you, uh, sometimes that doesn't sit well with families, particularly when you're talking about their children. So going that little extra, spending that extra time, going that extra mile to kind of explain things to them, sometimes you'll get a little bit better buy-in. Another thing we have is this remodeling poster. We have this on each one of our rooms in the fracture clinic. We utilize this daily to kind of explain to families uh, how the remodeling process occurs because when you see a fracture that looks like this and you're telling the family that this is going to remodel and heal and we really don't need to do anything, it's going to heal on its own and, and the child's biology is going to take over for us here, uh, that's kind of hard to swallow when you're a parent and you don't have the perspective that we do. So these, these fracture uh, posters or remodeling posters in our fracture clinic have been extremely useful to kind of give some examples and kind of show them uh, some, some evidence of that occurring. So number nine, moving on to number nine, a methodical exam is your best tool. Pediatric exams are challenging. We all know this. Any of us that uh, have kids or, have, or work with kids know it's extremely challenging. They're not only poor historians, uh, but they're also they have a hard time articulating where these symptoms are or what, what they're feeling or describing exactly what's going on. And sometimes it's a little bit of a, uh, a game of clue to try to sort out the, the details from the distractors. So when everything hurts, a little distraction can go a long way. Sometimes, you know, if uh, the child comes in and you're trying to find out if it's our wrist, but our fingers hurt, our wrist hurts, our elbow hurts, uh, the scratch on our knee hurts, you get these other distractors, you really got to pull out from that exam what, what's important, what's relevant, what's not. Uh, X-rays can lead you or can fool you, and history can lead you astray. So it's important. It doesn't mean we need to dismiss these. The history is extremely important. Your X-rays are extremely important. But a lot of times in pediatrics, uh, when we're looking at developing bone, um, the X-rays, you know, they can they can certainly trick you, particularly if you're not uh, used to to reading or interpreting. Uh, pediatric musculoskeletal x-rays. So you've got to be able to trust your exam. First and foremost, that's the, probably, in my opinion, that's the most important thing that you have. It's the one tool that you completely control. So take that extra time, be able to trust it, and be methodical with your exam. Uh, there's no, no substitute for attentive repetition, so being methodical with that exam. So the same approach each time you do a workup. So every time I'm working up a hand, I do the same exam. I go through the same steps every time, and it just kind of becomes natural and second nature. Uh, I would say that, that Dr. Ellis, Dr. Wilson, uh, Chuck, you guys doing knees and sports, I'll do the same thing with your joints. Uh, Dr. Miller and Dr. Chung with your concussions, I think everybody kind of has their same approach and you generally kind of implement that when these patients present and uh, becomes kind of second nature to you. Uh, one finger, one spot, something I always start out with. So when uh, this little nine-year-old comes in and they're, they're telling me about all these areas that hurt, I ask them, okay, I want you to take one finger, use this index finger, and I want you to put it on the one spot that is the worst spot that you feel like your, your symptoms are driven from or where are you the most sore at. And then they'll go from there, and that gives me a starting point. And then you need to kind of go from the point above and below. So you always need to examine that, that joint above and below. Sometimes you'll be surprised at what you find. <clears throat> growth plates and growth centers can be confusing. We'll touch on that a little bit later with uh, the, the physes and kind of developing or immature bone. And then don't let the radiology report distract you. We, uh, you know, both parents, healthcare providers, uh, clinicians across the board, we, we throw darts at the uh, radiologist sometimes, and I think we lose perspective that these radiologists oftentimes are sitting in a dark room uh, somewhere, often not at the same facility. They have no patient to examine. And in today's world, especially in the urgent care settings, places like that, there may not be a note that's been done or completed for them to res you know, kind of reflect back to. So they're looking at an x-ray of a developing uh, muscle skeletal system or a, a kid with open apophyses and physes, things that, that are you know, variable based on if we, we took 10 kids and lined them all up, you may get six or seven different variations of where that kid is, even though they're the same age. So they're having to comment on those things and find things that may be abnormal. And it's real easy to say, oh, well, that's not a fracture. But, uh, you know, I think the thing we have to keep in mind is that they don't have the ability or they don't have the, uh, the resource of that patient there for that clinical exam. So don't, don't be fooled when you see a report that comes in, and we get this quite a bit, where there's a read for a fracture through maybe the fifth metatarsal here where the apophysis at the tuberosity is. Uh, and in fact, all of the symptoms are over here on the, the second toe proximal phalanx. So, uh, they, these findings really should correlate. They shouldn't contradict, and don't let that fool you. Uh, here's a good example of why being methodical and kind of doing that same approach every time can kind of uh, keep you from, from missing certain findings that can be pretty important. You can look at this x-ray here, pre-benign appearing injury. Uh, this is a fourth metacarpal shaft fracture. It's very subtle. You really don't see, you know, you barely see that line, and you really don't see it on the other two images. But when you look at this patient's cascade, which if I had not done a cascade exam, I would have missed this, you'll notice that she's got a little bit of rotation through that fracture site. She's kind of crossing over here. So again, 
X-ray looks very benign, uh, very subtle finding, but a pretty significant difference on the, the cascade exam, and that's something that's very easy to miss if you're not being methodical in that exam. Uh, <clears throat> again, X-rays and histories are, are tools to augment your exam. You've got to be able to trust your exam, uh, particularly with kids and, and in adults as well. A lot of times symptoms come in as referred symptoms from another area, particularly uh, this here for anybody that does not know, this is a skiffy, a slipped capitella femoral epiphysis. Uh, this kid presented with knee pain, which these often do. Uh, you, you, examining that, that knee, when the patient comes in with that knee pain, you kind of realize, man, I can't really find anything on this knee. This knee seems pretty, pretty normal. There's no effusion. I can't really get any tenderness. I can't really elicit any positive findings. So as you kind of move up to that joint above, you find that that hip, you kind of start to see there's some symptoms in the hip and there's a little asymmetry in that hip. So maybe we should consider some hip x-rays and three weeks into this skiffy, we kind of find that uh, that's, that's a pretty significant finding and something that's one of the true emergencies in pediatric orthopedics and something that we need to be very serious uh, about finding and, and identifying when those occur. Uh, this is a good example of two x-rays that are similar in nature. One of these is a fracture and one of them is not. How are you going to know the difference? Well, going through your exam, that's what's going to tell you a difference. Is, is this an apophysis or is this a fracture? Um, does anybody want to guess which one is which, the top or the bottom? Who would vote the top one is a fracture? Anybody want to vote the bottom one's a fracture? No voters today. Everybody forgot their cards. <laughs> uh, so it actually was that the top one was a fracture. Uh, so this is a patient that presented with wrist pain, complaints of wrist pain, for three days after a fall on exam, really didn't have any symptoms or findings at the wrist. So no tenderness over the distal radius, uh, you know, no swelling, uh, no other real findings at that wrist. So as you kind of start going up the arm, you start to find out, okay, what else is going on with this patient? Well, they have lack of terminal extension. They can't really straighten this arm out all the way. Uh, they have pain with rotation of that forearm. And then as you're going up to that, that elbow to start palpating, you realize they have a little tenderness over their radial neck. And that's kind of the trad we see when we have these uh, non-displaced or these radial neck fractures come in, the, the very subtle findings. And oftentimes they present with wrist pain. But without a, a methodical exam, kind of always going through that step-by-step -step approach, you may miss that. Number eight, uh, missed non-accidental trauma can result in fatality. So uh, child abuse, or NAT as we often refer to it, uh, is, is extremely uh, challenging to catch sometimes. It's, it's something nobody really wants to deal with, but it's something we all need to be alert to and make sure we understand what to do when we, we see signs of it. So kids with uh, or children that present with fractures under the age of one year old, almost 60% or up to 60% of those may be NAT, 90% with kids under six months. So anytime you see that fracture or fractures in that, that age group, you really need to kind of uh, uh, that should heighten your awareness and kind of be alert and, and do a little bit more of an in-depth investigation as to what the mechanism was. So you're looking for things like an unwitnessed trauma, uh, inconsistent histories, things fracture doesn't match the story. Uh, this two-month-old rolled off the bed, uh, you know, things like that that, that really don't correlate. Uh, and looking for your signs of your skin stigmata with your bruises, your burns, multiple fractures in various stages of healing. So when we work these kids up, we generally do a skeletal survey. One of the uh, pathognomonic injuries we'll see is these posterior rib fractures in these kids. Um, uh, corner fractures or metaphyseal corner fractures. This is an example of a transphyseal fracture. So uh, young, young patients, you, you've got to be alert to these when they present with, with fractures. Uh, what leads to this are some of the risk factors to kind of think about. Well, we know that with younger, younger families, lower SES, lower education, unstable family situations, and then quite honestly, all this leads to, to stress to the family. So any of these, uh, these risk factors also need to be kind of highlighted. And then what do you do when this occurs? What, what are your resources? What are your obligations as healthcare providers or people that work with children? You know, we, we are obligated to, to uh, report this in the state of Texas. Um, so know your resources and know your obligations. Moving on to number seven, check the skin. So a fracture plus bleeding or a wound is an open fracture until proven otherwise. These aren't always all obvious. It doesn't have to be a bone sticking out and it doesn't have to be a, a big gross deformity uh, that, that's super obvious. Sometimes just these little puncture holes can be the hardest ones to find and, and easily missed. So, you know, looking through these, you can kind of see where these, these x-rays will correlate where with the wounds are. Uh, you can sometimes track some air through the x-ray, but a lot of times this is, again, a astute clinical exam, making sure you're not missing these and, and have a high suspicion for an open fracture anytime you see a, a wound with a fracture, particularly in the plane of deformity. 
Uh, these need to be promptly referred. It's important to get these out and get them to, uh, to the appropriate treating facility, depending on where you are and what your resources are. That's either an emergency room, it can be an orthopedic practice. Uh, I think these are ones that if you're going to send over to an orthopedist or you're trying to get set up that way, this deserves a phone call and kind of a heads up of, hey, this is what I have, what do you want me to do with it? Uh, because that really helps with planning. The key to this is getting antibiotics on board fast and getting appropriate treatment implemented. So uh, on that same topic, moving over to the, the nails. So our toenails, our fingernails, so a fracture and bleeding at or around the nail, you again have a high alert. This is an open fracture. In pediatrics, that's usually what we equip, the equivalent or what we call a Seymour's fracture where the growth plate is fractured. It's a Salter Harris II fracture that kind of kicks up that nail plate. Uh, and, and typically that germinal matrix can get stuck in here or some tissue can get stuck in here and be problematic. So again, these are, are something that need prompt treatment and they need prompt referral. If you see bleeding around the nail, you suspect a fracture, get this over to an ER, get this over to an orthopedist uh, or an orthopedic practice to kind of start management. I think again, this uh, is a good one to kind of call ahead and let them know it's coming so they can kind of prepare. This isn't your, your quick visit in the clinic if you're having to do something in the clinic or take this kid to the OR to a procedure unit. A little bit of planning can go a long ways. Um, so make these kids MPO and, and refer them out via phone call or to an emergency room, one of the two. Uh, the appropriate, treat, appropriate treatment for these, removing that nail plate, IND and washout, you have to reduce this fracture. This really should say open reduction, uh, more so than internal fixation, but sometimes you have to remove some of that entrapped tissue to get this fracture to reduce and kind of get things to heal. And the nail bed repair and then antibiotics. Antibiotics is highlighted in all caps because it's probably one of the most important parts. Uh, we really want to get these on board fast. And, and uh, Dr. Ho did a study in 2017. Um, the 12-fold increase is noted with inappropriate treatment. The primary factors to that being uh, timing to antibiotics as well as uh, washout and repair and the adequacy of that repair. Moving on to six. Splints and casts are not benign, and we, we talk a lot about this in our clinic, and we do a lot of outreach and kind of education with uh, other facilities because we, we do uh, work with children, and uh, some places that's all they do, some places that's not all they do, and so when you're less um, astute to, to what to look for and how to manage these kids, particularly with something simple like a splint or that seems simple like a splint, it's easy to, to cause more harm. Uh, so when we see these things come in, we do like to reach out to, to kind of community referral sources and kind of talk to them about, hey, we could do this a little bit better because oftentimes, as is the case for all of these injuries listed here or shown here, the immobilization really wasn't even needed. And so now we're dealing with a, a stage three ulcer that's gonna take you know, maybe a month or more to heal and kind of manage that when we really weren't, that this fracture or this injury to this leg was really gonna need a, a splint or a boot uh, maybe for a week or two and, and move on with life and, and things will heal and do well. They may not even have needed immobilization altogether and now you're dealing with a skin condition uh, that you may be managing for quite a while and, and certainly can uh, fester and end up with an infection that cause a much bigger problem. Uh, a lot of these in the heel and for any of you guys that do splints or put splints on, a lot of times what we see on these heel injuries is that it's either the splint wasn't applied properly, there wasn't padding in the back of the heel, any of your bony prominences need to have a little bit of extra padding on them, or when the patient was discharged home, nobody really explained to them that they said, go home and elevate. But they didn't talk to you about how you elevate or what you need to do when you elevate. So these kids will go home and they'll stack up two or three pillows or mom or dad will stack up the pillows or stack up uh, some towels, something to prop this leg up on. And then they're resting the heel right on the back of that towel or whatever it is they're resting on. And that's creating that pressure point. So it's important to educate these families, explain to them what, what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing, the do's and don'ts with the splints or cast. Uh, a lot of times you'll avoid these type of presentations to us, and it doesn't take long. You can see these changes at two days in a leg splint, two days in an ACE wrap. Uh, this is a, a little bit more of a severe case, but seven days in a splint. But these things are all very, very preventable, uh, and I think it's important to recognize that this, this sequel can happen with, with splinting and cast. Some more examples. So the first ones we saw were really ones that uh, the application or the education was pretty poor. Uh, on this set, this is really more of kind of the application problems in a sense that either we didn't pad those bony prominences or we didn't put enough padding or any padding and we didn't recognize that when we're putting these splints on, they're, they're releasing an exothermic reaction and we're releasing heat and we can, that can cause a burn. So many of these injuries you see here are results of burns or friction burns with that exothermic reaction. They didn't have any padding. They didn't kind of put the appropriate barriers on to prevent those. 
So educate your patients. Again, you need to go through and, and make sure they understand what to expect, what happens if, because we're dealing with kids, if is going to happen. So just anticipate it. Let that family know what to do with this casket's wet. Let the uh, patient, if they're old enough to understand, uh, you know, what to do if the casket's wet or the splint gets wet. Uh, this is a, an example of a, uh, a cast or a splint, actually, that was on a hand. Uh, you can see how macerated these fingers are. Now, this got wet about two weeks earlier, and the, the family just, or the, the patient just didn't tell his family because he didn't really think it mattered. The mom knew it actually had gotten a little bit wet, but felt like it would dry out eventually. They didn't need to worry about it much, so they didn't worry about it until two weeks later when they presented to clinic and kind of had all this macerated skin. So they need to know if the casket's wet, you need to go see somebody to get it taken off and, and a new one replaced. Um, you know, kind of giving them those tools. It's really our fault if we're failing to educate them on what to do if, if something were to happen. So you need to understand how to educate the patients, make them understand it. These are other examples. Don't put anything in your cast We all or your splint. We, we tell them that all the time. But we live in Texas and things get hot and sweaty and, and start to itch. So this 12-year-old put a marker down in his cast. Uh, he pulled the marker out, and lo and behold, the marker came out, but the cap did not. And for five weeks, he let that sit in there knowing it was there, but also knowing he's going to be in trouble if he told his mom he put that thing in there. And so he came in, we took the cast off, and uh, everybody was quite surprised to see this. We weren't as surprised as we would have been if we didn't have a little warning because he started crying about two minutes before the cast came off and kind of admitted there was something in the cast and he just had been scared to tell mom. Uh, this is another example of a little marker cap. And then this is our classical or our classic uh, coat hanger to the arm to scratch. So kind of teaching these families what they can do when you have uh, an itch, when you have an issue with the cast, kind of give them the do's and don'ts. Uh, a lot of the tips and tools we use is blowing cool air through that splinter cast. Uh, if it's you know tapping it with a spoon, something metal and give vibration can certainly help. Uh, Benadryl, loratadine or Claritin during the day, Benadryl at night. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly some other ways we can address this itching, but we don't want to ever let these patients put anything down their cast or their splints, um, staying out of trouble. So it's important that whoever's applying these in your facility knows what they're doing, that they understand what to be educating the patients on, that they are able to uh, kind of explain to these families the things to watch for, um, talking about the elevation, uh, placing things inside the cast, not attempting to reapply it. So if it comes off, you need to have it replaced somewhere else. You're never gonna get this to fit, particularly on a young kid, a two, three, four year old that's coming in, has a splint placed, it's kind of molded to them with some of that prefab material and then the family's been taking it on and off for two or three days and all of a sudden that fits very different. Uh, you're not gonna get a three year old not to walk on this leg splint and so expect them to do that and now they've got a, uh, it's kind of like a boot or something that's not gonna fit them quite well. It's never gonna fit the same as it was initially. It's gonna start rubbing them and irritating them and, and causing some skin problems. Number five. So not all fractures require a cast. Uh, we do a lot of treatment in, in pediatric orthopedics with very minimalist approach almost to what really requires a cast or mobilization. And a lot of that goes back to this, this, some of the images we just saw. Uh, sometimes the, the treatment can be worse than the actual injury and that's what you're trying to avoid. Uh, particularly with uh, our proximal humerus fractures. And I tried to find a, a, a pretty impressive one. This is not all that impressive, but man, these sometimes look really impressive that they will uh, have quite a bit of displacement and the treatment for these is a sling and some time. Uh, same thing with our clavicle fractures. In pediatric patients, we very rarely take a clavicle to the OR. There are some indications, but uh, they're, they're certainly the uh, exception and not the rule. The, the remodeling ability of the bone has a lot to play with that, and we'll talk about that a little bit uh, a little bit later. Our buckle fractures, so these little metaphyseal buckle fractures of the distal radius, we really advocate for these posterior splints. These kids tend to get a little bit faster uh, return to activities. They, they aren't quite as stiff. The, the bone healing is equivalent. Um, and then our toddler's fracture, this is probably the most common one we see with skin conditions. Again, all of those heel images we just looked at were generally a toddler's fracture, uh, something that uh, came in with a lower extremity fracture through our tibia is most, most commonly the case. Uh, these will be splinted oftentimes at an outside facility, and that's not the wrong answer. It's just that making sure the splint's applied properly, that there's good padding on the splint, uh, the bony prominence is padded, there's good education given to the family, particularly in regards to that elevation. Um, when we see these kids, and a kid under the age of three, I almost never cast these kids for anything below the knee. Uh, very, very few and far in between will we ever have to put a kid in a cast with this type of an injury. Uh, and even when they're, they're displaced, that's not necessarily the case in a three-year-old. We don't really, we, we don't like to cast them. We, we like to put them in these boots because these things are inherently stable. Uh, the thick, abundant 
the periosteum they have around their bones kind of helps keep that in, intact. And these kids are, in fact, able to walk on these, and, and they do much, much better in these boots than they generally will do in a cast or a splint. They tend to recover quite a bit faster, and, and we kind of avoid some of those skin issues. Uh, and then over here, our radial necks, same thing. We, we like to get these moving quickly. We generally will treat these radial necks for about 10 days, uh, somewhere in that time frame with a splint, and then we get them out of that splint, let the family take that splint off at the 10-day mark and get them into a sling and start working on range of motion. But it's hard sometimes to relay this message to families. You have to spend a lot of time, again, back to that education, educating the family and making them understand uh, the treatment and, and why that treatment is, is effective and uh, kind of reassuring them and showing them some good evidence that this is going to be okay, kind of get that buy-in from them. Because when you, you, sh you show them these x-rays and you say, yeah, there's a fracture here, well, it's hard for them to imagine. Well, there's a fracture, but you're telling me I don't need to have a cast or I, I don't need to do anything about it, it's just going to heal. So not letting uh, the treatment be worse than the injury. Again, just to kind of drive home the message about these lower extremity, uh, uh, this is the most common one we see. We probably get one of these, uh, you know, maybe not this severe, but once a week we'll see one of these uh, come in. And so uh, these are all very, very preventable injuries. Number four, most pediatric fractures can be managed without a trip to the OR. So. You know, when these patients come in, it's, it's trauma, so everybody's stressed out. Uh, you, again, you have to go back to that, take your time with these families, kind of get the family buy-in, the parental buy-in, and the patient buy-in. Uh, that, in, in our practice, really is, is kind of the, that's the bread and butter for our practice is really kind of sitting in there with those families and making them understand why this, you know, why we're doing what we're doing, what we're looking for, and, and what the uh, expected timeline or the map of this treatment plan is going to be. So you need to un try to avoid unnecessary procedures, and, and so a lot of these things will heal with, with pediatric injuries. Uh, understanding the principles of remodeling certainly help you avoid those. We'll touch on that a little bit later. Um, the a cost of a closed reduction in an ER or a clinic versus an OR can sometimes be four to five times higher, if not more. So when these are uh, able to be treated and managed non-operatively, over the last decade we have seen a little bit of an increase of these going to the OR, and there's, there's a, uh, multiple reasons that that has occurred. Uh, but it still stands that on the, you know, POSNA, the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of North America, their statement is that the standard of care for treatment of pediatric forearm fractures remains non-operative treatment with closed reduction in casting. An acceptable functional outcome with closed treatment is the rule of the majority of fractures. Uh, we truly believe in that, and we really give it, you know, give our all to try to keep these kids out of the OR if we can. Uh, now, there are some fractures that need to go to the OR for, for several reasons or different reasons, and, and those uh, we certainly have abundant resources to get them into the OR, but we try to manage everything we can through that fracture clinic or through uh, an APU. Uh, we have the ability to do nitrous in our clinic. We have the ability to take these patients to an advanced procedure unit, uh, have an anesthesiologist kind of let them go to sleep with ketamine for conscious sedation. And then we do a lot of hematoma blocks, um, kind of oral pain medication, pain control in clinic for some of these procedures. And we've been, really been surprised to see how well these patients tolerate this uh, in the clinic setting. And we'll do a, have a little example of that in a minute. Some of you may have seen this already from our symposium a couple weeks ago, um, but we'll kind of get to that. So our first case is going to be Jax. Jax is an 11-year-old male. He sustained a distal radius and ulna fracture playing hockey. He went to an urgent care last night and then presented to our walk-in fracture clinics, uh, which are 7.30 to 9.30 here at this campus. Uh, he was neurovascularly intact, really had no uh, red flags or, or any concerns with his exam through his hand or his wrist. So we discussed those treatment options with the family. We said, well, Jax has a fracture. There's some deformity. Uh, you know, we, he's 11 years old. We need to get this to a little bit better alignment. Um, we have a couple options. We talked about doing a pain medication. So typically, we'll use Valium and Hyset or Valium and Norco in our clinic, and then a hematoma block. Uh, we can do a closed reduction in casting here in the clinic, or we can try to get this set up for the APU. And that may uh, be today, or that may be tomorrow morning. You have to come back and let us uh, go to sleep with ketamine and do this procedure. And this family, uh, Jax is a, a pretty tough kid. I have actually treated Jax once before and knew the family very well. They very much trusted what we do in our clinic, and they said, well, let's just get it done today. We'd much rather get it done today. So we said, okay, let's do it. So this is going to kind of show you how, how Jax tolerated this. Uh, I think he did really well. So this is us doing the hematoma three, block. One, two, three, Pope. Good. So you can see the flash okay. of the hematoma coming up through here. A little burn from the cold medicine. Remember, it's like ice, ice water, okay? Good. Needles out, sharp's gone. Just gonna massage it and it's over. We did it. Is that as bad as you thought? No, not near as bad, was it? 
So, uh, full disclosure, I, I have a huge needle phobia when it's coming to me. I don't tolerate these very well. So I have a lot of apathy for these patients and, and I tell them all that. Look, man, I, I know it stinks. I don't, I, I don't do well with these. I'm the guy that turns white and sweaty and uh, either passes out or almost passes out every time. And I have to do this once a year. And, uh, so I get it. It's not fun. Um, but I, I found that if you really spend the time and kind of talk to these patients and, and then utilize your resources with distraction, we have a child life specialist in our clinic who's fantastic. Uh, she does a great job of distracting these kids. That goes a long way. Um, you know, and then just kind of watching how they tolerate them. They do a really good job. We also use cold spray, which is what you saw at the very beginning of that, which kind of just numbs that skin up a little bit right before that initial prick. So we did the hematoma block on him, and about this time, we'll, uh, we'll let one of our cast techs, which you'll see in a minute, kind of start pulling a little traction on this patient, kind of holds them a little traction. That kind of lets everything start to relax in there, get some of that, the muscles and those deforming forces kind of stretched out a little bit. Uh, and at that point, I generally will pull the family out. We want to let this marinate for five minutes or so, and we'll pull the family out, and I'll kind of explain to them what they're about to see, because we do advocate for our families to be in the room if they want to be in the room. Uh, we'll let them stay in. Uh, we'll generally tell them when I get in the hallway, I'll say, okay, I just wanted to go through this one more time and make sure you understand what you're about to see. Uh, orthopedic sometimes looks pretty barbaric. And so uh, we, we kind of utilize uh, what we know best or the way we, we most uh, or feel most likely to succeed in this particular fracture pattern. Uh, I like to use kind of counter traction with my own leg. And so I'll put my leg over their arm and kind of pull counter traction through my thigh. Uh, that looks a little odd if you're a family or a parent. Uh, you know, mom's sitting there in the room and she sees you doing that and she's like, what in the world is going on? So if you don't pull them out and kind of explain to them what they're about to see, you're gonna, you're gonna have a little conversation afterwards most likely that's uh, not always received well. So we'll kind of see how Jax does now. That block's set up well. Uh, this is Mr. Ricky. He's one of our cast techs. He's holding a little bit of traction for us. He's kind of been sitting here for probably seven, maybe 10 minutes max at this point. Uh, he has a little YouTube, I think, uh, going on here, watching a little bit for distraction. At this facility, this was at our older facility. We actually did not have child life here. Um, we do have them now, and man, it's, it's been awesome. They are really, really good at getting these kids to be uh, distracted, and especially our younger kids. So How's your let's see how feel? Jax does. It's tired? Oh, you don't feel anything at all? Does it feel better than it did? Yeah. yeah. Good deal. Are you happy we did the injection? Yeah. Now that it wasn't that bad. I told you it wouldn't be that bad, but I know it's scary to get injections sometimes. I knew you feel it go away. That's because you're tough. We can't really hear him, but he's telling us that he doesn't really feel anything. He feels fine. He doesn't hurt. He's glad we did the, the injection. He's worried about it at first, but now, now he... I was glad we did it and didn't think it was as bad as it yeah, was going to be. Yeah, let's go ahead and get be. the sock cut and we'll slide it on. Yes. How's that feel? It okay? Yeah, I don't feel anything. You don't feel it at all? I just feel it. go over, okay? Good. Okay, when I tell you, I want you to do that deep breath in, deep breath out, okay? One, two, three, go. Good job. Good. Okay, it's over. You did it. Great job. What do you think? All done. It hurts. Hurts a little bit? Aren't you glad we did the shot? Yeah. Yeah, you did great, bud. We'll get your cast on. And so as you can see, I mean, I think that's a pretty good example. Jax did great doing that. Uh, he did a really good job, and, and that that's how most of these go for us. Now, every now and then you'll get a, a kid that you read wrong and maybe this family wasn't the right family or the kid wasn't the right kid, but large majority of the time we're, we're right on that. And that, that comes from just experience of kind of filling these families out and kind of getting a better understanding of which ones are gonna be able to succeed in something like this versus needing to go to the APU or uh, a different manner to get this done. So how did Jackson end up? So this is him after post-reduction on the left. You can see him at six weeks. And again, these, these don't line up perfect. They, they aren't anatomic. And that's okay because I spent the first 20 minutes of this conversation with this family discussing to them what may or may not be the outcome of that closed reduction and what I'm looking for and what's acceptable and what we can allow to tolerate or be what we are able to tolerate and what we can allow to kind of uh, remodel with time. So when we got these x-rays and this didn't line up, it wasn't really a big shock to the family. We kind of already covered that. We anticipated that was going to happen. We talked about it. And, and they felt very comfortable. They, oh, yeah, it's exactly right. That's what he told us may happen. And so we'll continue to follow this. We watch it. We see it at six weeks. And then we see it again at 12 weeks. And we can see how much of that remodeling occurred. And Jax did really well with this. We saved him uh, a trip to the operating room. Uh, we saved him the cost of that, um, the, the risk with the general anesthetic. So sometimes that is the right answer. Uh, another example for us is going to be Kendra. Kendra is a 10-year-old gymnast. She sustained a, a displaced both bone forearm fracture while tumbling. 
I got a call, or the, the injury occurred at 2 p.m. At 2.45, I got a call from the coach who had my cell number to just say, hey, I was just sent a kid your way. She should be there shortly. Uh, they came in with the piece of the, the gym floor, the mat actually uh, with them. This was her splint. They splinted her on this with a little bit of tape and sent her in. So again, I knew Kendra, I knew her family. We treated her for a finger fracture about two years prior. Uh, she was neurovascularly intact. She did have a deformity. The skin was intact. She was calm and fairly comfortable. These gymnasts, you're either getting uh, very hypervigilant uh, family and patient, or you're getting a really tough uh, patient. One of the two is, is generally my experience with them. She happened to be on the, uh, the tough side. And so we talked again about uh, the options. We talked about closed reduction and with oral meds uh, versus APU the following day. This is a fracture pattern that really just needs a little bit of traction and rotation. There's not much to this to get this out. Uh, as long as you know what you're doing, you know that maneuver, it's generally uh, one that would reduce quite well. So that family said, yeah, let's go ahead and do it. So we went ahead and uh, did that closed reduction. We put her into this cast. You know, casting is really important with, with orthopedics. And, and to be honest, looking back at this now, I thought about it two days ago. It is probably too late for me to change, but that probably should have been in here as one of the top 10. We spend a lot of time doing cast. Uh, we, we put a lot of effort into cast. It's almost like molding pottery. And uh, they have all these weird creases and uh, indentions and things like that that sometimes people think, man, what, a, what is wrong with that kid's cast? Well, oftentimes, if somebody knew what they're doing, those are there on purpose. Those are intentional. They have a purpose. So kind of being hypercritical on my own cast here, I could have had a little bit better mold here. So you can see the mold, but it's not great. A little bit straighter border. We call this our ulnar border. If you can control this ulna, oftentimes you're going to be able to control the, the radius as well. So this has a little bit of a bow to it. It's not a real flat border. We'll actually take a board most of the time, and we'll lay, lay a, a board. It's actually a piece of wood plank from someone's floor uh, that we will lay flat against that cast and kind of push against that owner border to kind of get that owner completely straight and get that border straight. Because this cast is what I'm going to utilize to try to maintain the alignment of these fractures. This is where a lot of times, uh, you know, this is the, the struggle and the, the kind of argument of, well, should I just take this kid to the OR and uh, do an ORIF with a plate or with some uh, IM nails uh, versus managing this cast for the next several weeks, which can be uh, quite time consuming. It takes up another spot in your clinic. Uh, you may or may not have to change this cast. So when we do a procedure like this where we reduce these kids, we're, we're going to see them back at one week. Uh, to check the alignment and to check the cast fit. And if either of those things are off, we're going to need to make some adjustments. That may mean that we need to do the procedure over. It may mean that we just need to change to a new cast. It may mean that we need to uh, alter the cast in some way. This particular pattern is one that, that sometimes, rather than changing the cast out, which uh, obviously can be kind of stressful for the families and for the patient, uh, because you do run the risk of losing alignment. It's uncomfortable. They're still a little bit uh, concerned of having to do that process again. So sometimes we'll cheat and we'll do, uh, we'll kind of look for other options. We can see I anticipated, based off these findings after my cast that day, I knew I, I may have some trouble when she comes back in a week. It's kind of anticipated that and scheduled around it. When she came back, we did notice that she drifted a little bit. She's got about 11 degrees of apex uh, volar angulation in her radius. 10 degrees of a radius on the AP, 7 degrees on the, of the ulna. So we know these are, these are right on the border of what we can accept and what's, uh, what's tolerable, but we also know she's only one week in, that swelling's still going down, and, and things are still going to settle a little bit. So we follow her up, and we wanted to see her. We're planning to see her again the next week, but if I wait another week, these may increase to, to 15 degrees and to you know, 12 or 13 degrees, and we're kind of going down that path that we're getting further into the healing process, and our alignment's getting worse and worse. So uh, we had to do something, and what we chose to do on this, this patient, which works quite well with the this fracture pattern uh, is we cheat and we do a wedge. So we placed a 10 millimeter cast wedge, which you do by opening the cast 360 degrees. You kind of leave one area hinged closed. You open it on the area where you need to place the wedge. So for her, we're placing the wedge right here. Uh, you put in that 10 millimeter wedge. You can, you can go up to like 25 millimeters and kind of adjust it as you need to. But as you can see, this is kind of the general principle of that. We had apex volar angulation. We're trying to correct that with this wedge. So we move on and kind of see, well, how did that do? Let's see how Kendra did. Uh, Post-wedging images look great. We're very happy with that. The alignment's uh, restored. We're very happy there. So we'll check her again in a week. Uh, so that's just kind of a glimpse of what we have to do in managing these casts and kind of making sure that we're keeping this alignment straight. The, the end goal here is to keep these bones in an acceptable alignment for enough time for them to start getting sticky or kind of have a spot weld and start to heal in that position where we don't have to worry so much and check them so frequently. Uh, but again, this is a, a fracture that very much could have been managed in the operating room. Uh, but you know, if, if you're diligent with your casting, your your uh, trust in the family and the, the family trusts you, you can certainly. There's other options to to kind of talk about with them. 
So moving on to number three, physeal fractures. So injuries to our growth plates, a quick review. We have our epiphysis, our physis, our metaphysis, and our diaphysis. So the shaft, the metaphysis is way up here, this thick part of the bone. The physis is the growth plate itself, uh, and the epiphysis is up here. As we move on to classifying these, we talk about Salter-Harris classifications. That's usually what, or it's really what the majority of um, peds ortho folks are gonna talk about in, in regards to uh, physeal injuries. So a type one is at the same level, that's that Oreo cookie where the fracture is really through the, the physis itself. Uh, a type two is where you have a, the metaphyseal bone involved and goes into the physis. Three is below or the L for lower. Uh, so that's the, uh, the bottom part here into the epiphysis. A four is where it goes through the metaphysis of the bone, through the physis and into the epiphysis. And then we have our crush injury, which are type fives, a little bit more controversial. So these are important. These are really what makes uh, pediatric orthopedics and adult orthopedics very different, or it's a big part of what makes it different, because we have to understand that when there's trauma to this physis, uh, that may result in a, in a problem with growth moving forward. And so you've got to be able to anticipate which ones of these are going to be problematic and which ones may not. Uh, you have to, to know which ones you need to monitor closely and which ones you don't have to be quite as concerned about. Uh, less than 3% of them really result in a significant functional disturbance, but the ones that do can be a big problem. Uh, particularly, we, we pay close attention to our distal femurs, to um, our uh, proximal ulnas, uh, some of our, our lower extremity and our, our tibial, distal tibial physeal injuries. Um, Early anatomic reduction is key to success, and so if you, if you have one of these show up, this needs prompt referral. Once we get past day seven, we're essentially letting that physis and that process start to heal, and then we're creating a secondary trauma to get them back reduced. So we really like to do this early in the process, so when you see these come through, these need a prompt referral over to, to kind of get that managed as, as quickly as possible. Number two, not all fractures need an ER visit. Man, there's a lot of things that don't need an ER visit, and, and unfortunately, uh, nowadays, that's where most, most things go. Uh, almost 18 or, or 20 percent of ER visits are, are related to a fracture of some sort. Uh, know what your resources in your clinic or your situation are to manage. So if you have somebody come in, can you safely immobilize them? Do you have SAM splints? Do you have prefab splinting material? Slings, boots, splints, crutches, you know, what are your options? Kind of know what you have there. I think that's a good place to start. Uh, and then your ability to, to educate this family, kind of talk to them about pain control, warning signs, what to monitor, what to look for. Uh, this is, for instance, if you're trying to treat, keep these kids out of the ER. Um, immobilization and education we've talked about, and then a referral to ortho via that, a phone call, um, or just kind of the referral process, wherever your resources are for referrals, just kind of know and be familiar with their process. Uh, we make it quite easy here where it's, you know, 7.30, 9.30, send them in that next morning, we'll take care of them. Uh, when do you need to send them to the ER? Well, I think it's a little easier to say, no, what can't wait. So orthopedic emergencies, these are not inclusive. Uh, open fractures, obviously that needs uh, urgent, it needs to go to the, or emergent needs to go to the emergency room. Neurovascular concerns, severe swelling, severe clinical deformity, uh, skiffy, femur fractures, and then pain uncontrolled with PO meds. So outside of these, most things really can be safely immobilized and, and referred over to ortho within 24 to 72 hours and get them taken care of. Uh, again, this really goes back to know what your resources are and how, how you would approach or manage these in your office or whatever setting you're practicing in. And then our number one, Pediatric bone remodeling is pretty remarkable. Man, is it. It's, it's super impressive. Uh, it's, it's really rewarding to kind of watch these fractures heal and kind of explain this to the family on the first visit and kind of watch it uh, evolve and, and watch how, they, how surprised they are at kind of the, the incredible ability that the pediatric skeleton has to remodel. So being familiar with this, knowing that pediatric bones are structurally different, they're less dense, they're more porous, they have increased elasticity, that just kind of leads to some of those bowing deformities or where you get a little bit of what we call plastic deformation. And these will tend to bow or bend like a stick and, and not actually fracture or crack through. Uh, they have a thick periosteum. Uh, we describe that the periosteum a lot of times like taking a twig out of a tree. You snap that twig in half and you know it's broken, but you can sit and wiggle that twig because the bark stayed attached in the, on the twig. So you know it's broken. You can do this and wiggle the two pieces, but it's actually stayed together because of that periosteum. And that thick periosteum that these pediatric patients has really helps us with uh, uh, kind of, one, it can help us with the reductions. Sometimes it can hurt us the reductions, uh, but it also helps their healing and, and their ability to keep these uh, fractures stable. So potential to remodel, basic principles, let, younger the age, proximity to the physis, and then the activity of the adjacent physis equal greater remodeling potentials. A uh, couple examples to run through. Here's a femur fracture that you can see was healed, about 25 degrees of angulation. You can see one year later how well it remodeled. Uh, same thing down here with our distal tib fib. Uh, remodeling's pretty impressive there, but it gets better. We can go to the next one. This is a uh, 
a proximal humerus fracture. We can see how angled that is. That's a pretty bad deformity. This is a tough one to kind of sell the families on that, hey, this is gonna be okay. We'll generally treat this with a hanging arm cast. So we put a little weight in the cast. We kind of pull that weight traction down through the elbow to put a little gravity and we let gravity do its work. So over time that continues to heal. It uh, kind of re reduces it a little bit with the, the, ha the hanging arm cast and the weight and the gravity through there. And then at the eight week mark, you can see we're looking pretty good. At the six month mark, we're, we're really good. We're starting to remodel that whole process. Uh, this kid will do just fine and, and no surgery was needed. Uh, another example, similar fracture, uh, pretty hard to sell the family on that. Uh, it's definitely why we keep this example around to kind of show these families. One year later, looks fantastic. So uh, not over treating, you know, this, this may be a fracture that you take to the OR and uh, do a simple pinning, uh, try to reduce this and fix it. And this kid gets an infection. And so, you know, did you really help that patient by taking them to the OR? Uh, or, or would it have been better to let this heal and remodel so that the point is not trying to figure out which one is because there's different things that will point you in one direction or other for that from the decision making standpoint. But the point is to be aware that remodeling can occur and, and not over treat by ignoring that fact. This is a clavicle shaft fracture. Uh, I do wish I had one that showed it maybe a year later and give us a little bit better idea of the remodeling. But again, you can see a lot of displacement, a little bit short uh, at five weeks. You can see that bridging callus through here. And then at eight weeks, you really start to see that bridging callus. It's kind of uh, united, fully united. And, and that remodeling process will then start to occur. Uh, humeral shaft, again, mid shaft humerus this time. So at presentation at one week, uh, this kid was also in, in a little bit of a hanging arm cast with a little bit of a mold on it. And you can see at the 10 week mark how much you're starting to remodel and this will continue to remodel. If we took an x-ray a year later, you'd, you'd barely be able to tell that this fracture ever occurred, if at all. Uh, functionally, these kids will be very stable. We just need to know what the acceptable parameters are. We need to understand that and know what we can tolerate and what we can't and what we need to do to adjust if they occur. Uh, one other example, a distal radius. So this is what we consider or call an overriding distal radius. This is presented at 13 days. This is much like Jax's injury. So the simple question is, well, why didn't you go ahead and reduce that? You reduced Jax. Well, uh, that's a viable question. And uh, I think something that you know, consider is this kid's 13 days out. He's already started to heal. So it'd be a lot more challenging to get this fracture reduced, particularly in a, in a clinic setting or in a, without, without an open reduction that we've, we've kind of showed is not really necessary. So when we have these uh, present, the literature tells us that if we will watch it, you know, put this in a cast, kind of try to not let it get worse, uh, put it in a cast, let this continue to heal, that this will remodel and do well in the appropriate patient based on age and uh, the location of these injuries. So you can see at the four month mark, quite a bit of remodeling has occurred and this kid's doing great. Another example, this is a three month old that came in. Uh, this is that first example with that family that was real confused about the uh, outside orthopedist that told them this just needs uh, some time, really doesn't need anything, no sling, nothing, just give it time, it's going to heal. Uh, so after a lot of discussion with that family and kind of showing them example after example and kind of walking them through the timelines, uh, they said, okay, well, let's do it. And uh, I saw them back here probably mm, two or three months ago and at our one year follow up and this looks fantastic. Uh, we, we really did not necessarily need to or have to do this, but the family had a lot of concerns about that remodeling. There was also a little spot down in the elbow that we were monitoring just to make sure it continued to, uh, to heal as we expected. All right, so that's kind of all we have. What questions do you guys have? Does anybody have any questions or anything they want to know more about? I was particularly compelled about the, uh, uh, well, for, I guess first my comment, but, um, you know, earlier I, s I saw a lot of physical therapists here earlier, and, and you know, I think the, uh, uh, my understanding is that the Texas legislation is probably going to approve uh, the ability to see patients with, you know, 30 days without a physician, and that's currently uh, on their docket, and I, I suspect it's probably going to go through in the next six months. And um, the one thing that Jared talked about, I would just further emphasize is, um, the one thing I worry about, at least in pediatrics, is the complaint of knee pain and missing um, a skiffy. Um, and so he showed that x-ray earlier. And, you know, to me, that's probably the most important, one, one of the most important things that, you know, I, I concern myself with, that oftentimes we see kids that have knee pain that are being, being treated for knee pain, uh, but yet no one's ever examined their hip before. Um, and so, so a loss of rotation or an asymmetric exam uh, within the hip joint um, is something that to us is, is an orthopedic emergency. We usually admit those patients and uh, we either do those same day or next day. 
uh, because they're very, very important. And so, um, you know, those kind of aspects, at least in the pediatric and the growing athlete, um, is one that I just wanted to emphasize once again. Um, for those that, for, for you guys, if you guys end up seeing patients within the first 30 days of the injury. Uh, and then my question is, uh, you know, the, these uh, cast burns are, those pictures are, are really impressive to me. Um, you know, we, we traditionally use uh, plaster of Paris or, or just fiberglass. Um, is there a type of material? I, I suspect that a lot of people in the community um, have, you know, used certain materials that may be more at risk of burns um, and wanted to just get your thoughts on if there was a, a type of material or um, a provisional split recommendation that you would have to avoid these burns? Yeah, I think that's a, that's a good point. Um, I don't know that I would say one particular brand or one particular product, but I do think that it, uh, again, the, uh, the skill set, the ability to put these on safely is certainly a big part of it. So being able to properly apply it, know where you need to add a little bit extra padding. A lot of these prefab materials that are out there now are kind of made to, to be quick and efficient. You cut, you cut the piece off, you measure it, you cut the piece off, it's already got a little bit of a, a cotton barrier on one side, uh, some of them even on both sides, and then you, you apply that in the splint. Uh, oftentimes they're gonna tell you you don't even have to put any kind of uh, web rule or cotton or anything in, in there as a barrier. But what we found is that with kids, which uh, those, those products may have been designed for both, but in general with kids, as opposed to adults, they're not gonna be able to advocate for themselves. When that heel starts to rub, they can't come say, my heel hurts. They're just gonna say, my leg hurts. And they're telling you their leg hurts, and you say, yeah, I know you have a fracture, I'm so sorry, let me give you some Motrin. And you really, you kind of are, are you're not aware of the fact it's a different kind of hurt. And so I think it's application of the splint, uh, proper padding, and then educating the family for the warning signs is, is probably the more important than, than what product you're actually using. Does that answer your question? Okay. The other thing that I, I, we use, I use in my practice a lot are these educational handouts. And I was curious as to the, the, the cast handout that you have or um, that, that you give in terms of education following an injury uh, and, and education for cast care. Um, are those available online for others to use? Um, and do you have any uh, material for how to put on a proper cast for maybe some in the community that would like a refresher or a little YouTube video. Yeah, we uh, we do not have a YouTube video. That is something we've talked about. We do have some materials. Uh, I believe they are available online. I would probably defer to Brandy to see if that's the case. But if they're not, they will be shortly. Um, I'm pretty sure they are, though. And then as far as kind of the splinting education, you know, we do a lot of outreach. We do a lot of these splinting clinics. We, we did a, um, a sports medicine symposium that uh, Dr. Miller put on here at this campus a couple weeks ago, and that was part of the, uh, the lecture there. So uh, there's certainly opportunities uh, for people to learn splinting, and if it's something you guys are interested in, we're, we're always uh, happy to kind of help out and give some community education. Uh, we have a really good booklet that we put out that's kind of a step-by-step -step approach to splinting that uh, if you wanted a copy of that, just shoot us an email, and uh, we can get that over to you.